Our first speaker is Margaret Ritchie. I first heard Margaret talk about herring gutters at the Scottish Records Association conference last year, I think it was Margaret. And I just realised, having been here all this time, and even with Fisher folk in the family, there was still more I had to learn. So um, I think we'll all realise that we've still got more to learn when we hear to Margaret today, uh, the nuances of the lives of the women. And I'm just really pleased that she's that she's here today. I'm sure you'll enjoy her talk and I'll hand over to her now and, and get questions from some of you afterwards, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Hi there. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to everybody today and I'll just dive straight in. Female occupations in the fishing trades included fishwives, independent traders with hawkers licences from kin-based fishing communities, and herring gutting crews responsible for the production of quality controlled salt cured herring in the highly successful British herring trade. Herring women negotiated their contracts directly with curing company representatives and this occupation was not restricted to women from fishing communities. My research on Scottish women in the herring trade covers the period 1880 to 1939. The 1880s saw the British land-based herring curing trade well established from its development throughout the 19th century. Scottish curers, fishermen, coopers and female gutters and packers dominated this industry. Scottish women employed as teams of three called gutting crews were the key skilled workers who had to work to fishery board regulation standards and were undoubtedly the backbone of the British herring trade. It had developed methods of pro processing fish, fishing catches as they were landed on shore, which challenged the Dutch monopoly of previous centuries they had used methods of catching and packing ungutted herring on board huge fishing vessels. Salt cured herring was a popular staple preserved food exported all over the continent of Europe, shipped from Aberdeen to the Baltic states and by train ferry to other European destinations. These exports contributed £7 million to the British econ economy during the inter-World War period. The most successful period was for the herring trade was between the two World Wars. Then de it declined rapidly after World War II, when many of the largest markets were politically no longer open for trade. Independent licensed traders called fishwives have a long trading history in Scotland, travelling to towns and cities, selling fresh fish to customers from all walks of life. In my hometown of Musselburgh, fishwives were still working in the 1980s and I carried out oral history interviews with them where they talked about their experiences and their working practices. While operating as individual traders, they had interesting and supportive collective working practices. The fishing industries as a whole have been poorly served by historical research and there has been little recognition of the important and independent roles played by women as fishwives and herring gutters and packers. However, their distinctive occupational clothing and outdoor working spheres has often generated interest in their working identities, particularly as subjects of postcards and posters, which may have have been attractive visual images, but do not give voice to their working lives and experiences. These were women who had either traders licenses or seasonal contracts, paid taxes and organised their working lives, travel and childcare options. In the case of female her herring workers, they had seasonal contracts and worked to fishery board standards, facing the challenges of working away from home for long periods. The fishery board for, Scot board for Scotland, as you will see from this map, was divided into different areas 
and that included the Isle of Man, and inspectors would go out and inspect the the work, and, their, and that included asking women to empty their barrels, and they didn't get the the pass the quality control measures if they they hadn't uh, packed the the barrel properly. Um, now, the Isle of Man is interesting because it was a favourite summer fishing ground for Scottish fishing boats, and two fishing communities on the 1st of 4th made this annual journey. Um, now, as I said, the two fishing communities on the 1st of 4th made the annual journey down to the Isle of Man for the, the, the very busy summer her herring fishing, and that was Anstruther, um, where the fishing museum uh, is today, on the north side of the first of fourth, and on the south side, that would be Fisher Row. Now, Fisher Row. Fisher, the fishing community of Fisher Row is part of the town of Musselburgh. Musselburgh sits on the coastline of the first of fourth, just east of the city of Edinburgh and has a long history of women working as independent traders called fishwives. While I was a member of the women's unit at Film Workshop Trust in Edinburgh, I received a research grant from Channel 4 and interviewed fishwives and mutterwives in Fishero about their working lives and practices. This material was made into a short documentary called It's Handed Dune. It's now archived in the School of Scottish Studies at Edinburgh University. The word wife has no, here has no relationship to marital status, but attached to a commodity describes a female trader, such as a sand wife, a salt wife and a fish wife. The statistical account of Scotland for 1795 registers 49 fishermen in Fishero and 90 fish wives. While a member of the Women's Unit at Film Workshop Trust in Edinburgh, I received a research grant from Channel 4 and interviewed fishwives and mutterwives in Fishero about their working lives and practices. This material was made into a short drama documentary called It's Handed Down, now archived in the School of Scottish Studies at Edinburgh University. Um, the statistical account of Scotland for 1795 reg registered 49 fishermen in Fishero and 90 fishwives, describing the working methods of these women and demonstrating that this was an occupation whose organisation and management skills were handed down through the female line, bearing all the hallmarks of a female guild. The figures in this graph, uh, which I collated from the 1909 census, show that in Fishero they worked from the age of 15 and into their 80s. Accompanying a family member, usually their mother, on a working day before they left school, they would be trained in carrying the creel, buying fish at the fish market, and learning how to sell to customers from all backgrounds. They had hawkers' licences, which covered designated areas, usually in Edinburgh City, Midlothian, and parts of the county of Fife. I'm trying to get the next slide up then. I'm sorry, it's, it's not, I'll, I'll just carry on speaking. Now, this is a still from my film. Uh, it's a, a, a black and white photograph of Elna Ritchie, one of a number of children from fishing families who took part and in the film I made, she took the part of a young fishwife setting out in the market on her first day, looking through the school gates, wearing a set of working clothes and a new creel and skull basket. The skull is the top basket and was used to separate out the oily fish from the fish in the creel. Inside the creel would be a board to use for filleting a customer's choice of fish and a filleting knife. When the creel was full, it would weigh around 50 kilos and had to be balanced on the shoulders and back with a leather strap worn across the forehead. Although the fishwife's outfit gave a distinctive trading image, it was designed to suit the occupation. She wore a, what was called a shagoon, a type of T-shaped shirt with deep armholes to facilitate the lifting on and off of the creel. 
It was lined with muslin to soak up the sweat, and the sleeves had a separate loose liner, folded back to make a cuff which could be removed and washed every day. The striped apron had a deep band which helped to support the lower back, and between it and the flannel skirt was a pooch or pouch, a bag with two pockets, one for paper money and one for coins. The cloak which had slits instead of sleeves was called a brat and was padded and pleated along the shoulder line to help with the weight of the creel. These women carried on working when they married and had children, paying local women as ch child minders and retaining their financial independence. Fishermen worked away at sea for long periods and as their catches were not always guaranteed, families often depended on fishwives incomes. This is how Peggy Livingston, one of the retired fishwives I interviewed, described their community. It was a matriarchal society, really. You handed over all the money they ma you made to the day you were married to your mother. Then once you got married, you never told your husband how much you earned, ever. If they teased you or chaffed you, you just say you had a, had a good week. And Walter Scott, in one of his books, would echo that sentiment. Um, he has one of his fish characters, who's a fishwife, saying, Them that sells the goods guide the purse. Them that guide the purse rule the house. I'm not having a lot of luck, it seems to have frozen. Right. Fish was sold by auction and Peggy described buying fish at New Haven Market on her working days using a system called casting the kyles. That's K-Y-L-E, which is an old Scots word uh, for taking a chance. Um, an experienced fisher or fishwife would bid, bid for the and buy boxes of different types of fish on behalf of herself and a group of fish workers. The fish would then be laid out in piles on the market floor for the number in the group. The best fish would gain the best prices and items from each uh, woman, a stone, a matchbox, maybe a haddock head, would be taken to a stranger across the market floor and asked them to come and cast the kyles by placing one item on a pile of fish, creating a fair system. The same evening, the fishwife who had bought the fish collected the shared cost from another fishwife, a system which allowed a girl to start up her own business without initial finances. Mutterbrook had several factories uh, where women were skilled workers, and um, some of the women um, were involved in working in the net mill. Although they weren't fishwives, they were um, if they were part of a fishing family, they, they still took part in all the um, social uh, community occasions and were thereby entitled to wear a fishwife's dress clothes. Um, now let's look at the Scottish women working in the herring trade. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to get this to talk to me. The development and management of a land-based British fish curing trade depended on having skilled workforces able to produce a quality controlled product, which from the 1880s would rival and supersede the Dutch-based monopoly of previous centuries. This was an industry dominated by Scottish curers, Scottish fishing vessels, Scottish coopers and Scottish women who graded, gutted and packed the fresh fish into barrels as the most important part of the fish curing process. And they were able to get the success by having a system where um, fresh, because for example, uh, the, the repeal of the salt tax and they obviously use large quantities of uh, coarse salt, Investment in harbour improvements meant they could cope with huge increases in fishing vessels. Raw goods, finished products and large workforces needed ferry and rail transport to and from se seasonal curing stations. Skilled workforces had to be employed on seasonal contracts and these contracts were ne negotiated well before the work began. 
Women on seasonal contracts were the key skilled workers of the herring trade, and they managed that um, while organising their travel and childcare. Women were contracted as a crew of, of three gutters and one packer to travel away from home for several weeks or months at a time with, um, with a contract from each season. As well as travel costs, the contracts included a signing on fee called an arrow, a weekly wage, in some places accommodation, and two additional payments were made to the packer, an early rate for chopping up the barrels before they were finally sealed, and an end of season bonus for the number of barrels she had packed. The arrows would be used to buy boots, oilies, which were the long rubber aprons, and empty flower sacks to tear it into strips called clutes to bandage their fingers and protect them from the sharp gutting knife. It would seem likely that the packer would negotiate these terms when curers came to signing up gutting crews. Curers com competed for the most experienced crews. One crew from Wick and Caithness signed a contract in 1931 to work in Shetland the following year in 1932. Their contract was headed, We the Undersigned First Class Women. When curers had had a poor season and cut the wages, women, such as the Cordoner family from Peterhead, made a legal challenge. This family took the Icelandic company to court in Aberdeen and won their case. Um, curing stations were set up along um, coastal strips and unfortunately, you know, I've got some really good photographs and I don't know what's happened to my... Everything seems to have frozen. I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to show you the photographs, but I'll. Women worked. The, the fresh herring was poured into a huge wooden trough called a farland. And uh, two of the two women uh, in the crew, two women gutted the, the herring and one woman did the packing. So the gutters would be standing around the, the farland. Um, gutting uh, fish all day and that meant you had to keep the slit the belly of the fish and take out the long gut and the small gut you had to keep the fish whole and then you had three baskets behind you and you had to grade them depend depending on the size and maturity of the fish then these baskets would be passed to the um to the packer now her she had a number which was stenciled on the bottom of the empty barrel because she got a, an end of season bonus for the number of barrels she had been packed. They worked long hours in all weathers, suffering from cuts from gutting knives and salt sores and it definitely was a very physically challenging job. Um, after, after the barrels had been filled, they weren't sealed. A loose lid was placed on top and barrels were left for between 10 and 12 days, depending on the type of uh, cure that the, the buyer wanted. The salt evaporated and the liquid was poured away and then packers went back to fill up the barrels, um, a job that they did um, and were paid on an early date and then the barrels were, were sealed and uh, taken away. The largest and the longest of the curing seasons was at East Anglian towns of Lowestoft and Yarmouth from the end of September until the beginning of December. Women travelled in their thousands to work at East Anglia, and as for the shorter seasons, first aid stations, restrooms and sometimes a creche were provided by missionary groups and the British Red Cross. Transporting these large workforces was big business for the railways who were able to provide rail travel for a large number of contract workers, as well as providing separate freight carriage um, for the remain luggage trunks, which in Scotland these trunks would be called KISS. Um, one of the... Uh, I interviewed Alan Marr from Wick, whose mother, uh, Tina, was a, a herring packer and um, Alan's father died suddenly and Alan's mother was left with the 
his, his two elder sisters and Alan. And before that, she had worked locally at the at the herring, but then she became the main breadwinner and she she went away to to work at the at the East Anglian um, autumn and winter fishing. Well, she went actually went to to Yarmouth. Now, the a, a trunk with would would arrive back first because that was carried separately as free. And Alan and his sisters always looked forward to it coming back because they dived into it to see what presents she had bought them. But one year Alan looked in vain, there was nothing for him. So when his mother's train arrived the next day, he went to the station to find out why. Now the answer to that was that Tina had had an exceptionally good um, season and she got a bigger than usual end of season bonus and she arrived off the train with a two-wheeler bike for Alan. So he was he was more than happy. Um, I think because I'm not able to show you the, the, the last photograph, which is a railway poster. And the last photograph is a, a railway poster and it um, shows a very um, romanticised idea of a, a a herring gutter with a, a shorter than usual skirt on and definitely no fish scale, sign of fish scales or dirty clutes. Okay, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for that, Margaret. Um, as, um, as Margaret said, we're really sorry about the technical difficulties. We did have a quick run through before and um, there were similar issues. Um, we will uh, send out the slides after the event so everyone can look at her wonderful photographs and also for the recording I'll edit it so that it lines up with the PowerPoint as well. Um, so hopefully um, everyone will be able to um, see the wonderful presentation as she imagined. Um, and hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? Um, Pete Coulson, uh, would you like to ask your question? If you unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me, Margaret? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could tell us any more about the idea of groups of women setting up their own businesses. Because you said something that's really interested me about how some form of loan or something which allowed them to start up without any capital or something like that. And I didn't quite catch what you said. So could you tell us any more about that? The groups of fishwives well, were setting up businesses. Well, well, the thing about the fishwives is, so they were single traders, right? They would get a license for themselves as one person, right? But when I did the research with this uh, group from Fisherow, they had this collective way of working. So one uh, well-established fishwife would buy the fish at the market. She would use her own money to buy the fish. And then you would go off and sell your fish. You know, if you were a new fishwife starting out, and then at the end of the day, she would send you around a note to tell you how much uh, you were owing. So in business terms, it meant that you didn't have to have any what we would call now startup money. Um, and I think that that was a, a very um, supportive way of working. Um, I do know one family where there was five fishwives and what they, had, they did every Sunday night, they sat around the table and decided collectively on the prices they were going to charge so that they all charged the same prices. And then they found that one of the girls just kept say, giving her price for any fish as a shilling. And they realised that she didn't really understand much, enough about numbers. She was, shall we say, arithmetically challenged. And so what they did with her was they took her off the fishwife's job and sent her to work on a farm because it, they, they couldn't have that. But some of the women um, would, two, uh, women coming back from the gutting would, would have enough money, uh, would have quite a bit of money. And then some of them, I know some of them decided to start up fishmonger's shops. And also 
um, Amy, or um, she went, her um, selling patch was across uh, the, uh, uh, the fourth road bridge, uh, the fourth rail bridge, and it was in Berkeley and Rosais. And during World War II, she sometimes couldn't get on a train um, because of all the sol soldiers and sailors had priority. And after she'd had enough of that, she, she gave up going with the creel and, and opened her own uh, fish shop. I hope that helps, Pete, Pete does it? Okay. <laughs> Okay, and we've also got a question in the chat from Sarah for you, Margaret. Um, so, were the tight head coverings a crucial part of the herring girls' working gear? Um, I, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure about crucial, but um, certainly uh, they wore different types. I've seen um, some of the um, ones that look like big scarves and, and they're folded round. I've seen a lot of women from the Western Isles wearing them. Um, I think it was just, um, well, something that, first of all, a lot of the time they'd be standing out in, in the cold. It would be to keep them warm and, and obviously to keep their hair out as, uh, you know, the, working with the oily fish could be really unpleasant and fish scales and, and oily hands and so on. Um, but I, I don't think it was any formal, um, it wasn't any part of any formal uniform is what I'm going to say. Okay. okay. And another question from Anne-Marie in the chat. Uh, what proportion of the women travelled around the coast compared to those who only worked at their own port? It's difficult to work that one out. Um, I think that I think the majority of of women, I, I think the women who just worked and round, you know, decided to stick to their own area. Well, first of all, if women who were just starting up would be put into what was called a green crew, you know, in other words, you know, um, ones with not very much experience, they definitely wouldn't uh, go away. And I, I get the impression it was maybe more um, some of the older women, more experienced women. Um, it, it's certainly, I, I think a lot would be to do with um, the opportunity because when you went away, uh, there was an opportunity to make more money. So a lot would depend on maybe your family circumstances. And um, and, and I don't think people had a problem with the women going away uh, because they were all working together. They were a crew of three. And, and from their own town, they all travelled together, uh, saved several hundred of them on the same trains and, and so on. The only people that had objections to that were the the Church of Scotland and Free Church um, missionaries who felt that uh, any woman travelling away from home would be open to, um, you know, um, it, it just wouldn't be good for us uh, to do stuff like that. Um, but I, I don't have an exact number, Anne-Marie, but that, that's the kind of impression I get. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and um, a clarification check from Jambi Brown. Um, she's written, Margaret mentioned the wage as an ARUI. Did she hear that correctly? No, it's an ARL. It's A-R-L-E-S. That's the English version. And it comes from a Gaelic word which I can't, sorry, I can't remember, which means earnest pledge. But if, if Jan wants to email me, I'll, I'll, I'll send the information to her. Thank you. And um, another question from Rona. It's, um, how old were the girls when they started and did they retire or stop when they got married? No, they definitely didn't. Uh, stopped when they got married um, and the age for fishwives and herring women uh, seemed to be 15 
uh, which is not as young as some women went out to work, but I'm wondering if maybe that was to do with the very physical nature of the work and it was felt that maybe younger uh, women uh, wouldn't be able to do that. If you look at the, the fishery board reports on the conditions of work for women, they divide them into young women 15 to 17 and then women from 17 up, uh, upwards. Um, they definitely didn't um, <laughs> didn't stop. Uh, Pe Peggy Livingston, she had her second son was born in December and she went back to work in, in January. Um, and and the, the, the herring women are interesting. I think people assume that you would just leave your, your kids with their grannies, but of course what you have to remember in those days, um, well what they did was, that was a combination of things. Alan Marr uh, was sent to live with a granny of one of his uh, school schoolmates. Um, a lot of the women took their children with them. Uh, the late Sue Innes, who was one of the um, editors of the Biographical Dictionary of Scottish Women, she was from, a, her father remembered going away with his mother, and she said that in my family, the women went away not in a group of three, but in a group of four, because there was always one who was pregnant and she looked after the children. But I've also been doing some research into the um, the school inspectors reports and there's a big um, schools in Peterhead and Peach, the teachers objected to the, the reports say, uh, talking about a certain age group of, of children who fell far below the attainment level and they said but hang on a minute these, women, these children are away for three or four months at a time with their mothers and, and that would account for it. And they were asked to collate all the figures and so on, you know, and for each child, boys and girls, for each child to see what age they were and how long they, uh, they stayed away. Um, and then <laughs> a school inspector's report for uh, Yarmouth uh, talked about the problem. They, either Most of the children didn't turn up to school. The ones that did only turned up for a couple of weeks and then but the teachers also had a problem because they couldn't understand the regional dialects and the inspectors concluded that the, the answer to that was to bring a teacher with you. But how they were going to get a teacher who could understand all the, the dialects from the Western Isles, Orkney, Shetland, Caithness, all the way down. Um, but no, um, um, having children was definitely not a barrier to this kind of work. Uh, any more questions from anybody? I think there's a comment, not not from um, not a question, but from from Carolyn saying that her mother from Peterhead went to school in Yarmouth when she was there with her mother and grandmother. And she was put in class with the kids a year older than her. That must have been oh, no. <laughs> quite stressful. Did, 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 she, did uh, she have any problem? Did they all have problems understanding each other? Or, or maybe children just got on with each other. Maybe it was the adults that had the problem. With, uh, I think Carolyn says yes, they, they, they got on like they understood. Or, or maybe they had, yeah, maybe it was yes that they had trouble. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Carolyn, about your family's experience or, oh, they all got on, brilliant, mm -hmm. good, yeah, I suppose there was a kind of, the, the, the fishing community, you might get on better with someone from the other side of the country that's from another fishing community mm -hmm. than you would from people in your own country, but from the city or something. Mm -hmm. And, and also the that. fact that uh, children would just find it easier to go on with other children, no matter what background they're from. Where adults have a different perception of that. Um, you've, as Carol, 
as Cathy said, you had you have got lovely photos, Margaret. And we'll, what we might possibly try and do is, if you maybe can get your PowerPoint email to Cathy, we can maybe share a couple right at the very end. That would and be great. Because there's Thank a lovely you. one of the girls at the station and things. I think everybody would like to see. Um, there's a, Am I no, allowed to... I, I've, I'm unmuted. Are people allowed to speak as well as just make a chat room question? Yeah, you've got, if you've got, yes. Um, right. Okay, well, I just wanted to add, I'm so sorry I missed the start of your uh, speech, your presentation, Margaret. Okay. I had an awful job getting on at all. And just the point that I thought uh, might be of interest, but it may not be because you've maybe already covered it. But in Gordon, where I come from, herring fishing, I have noted here in part of my more modest research that Mima McLeod travelled to Fraserborough as late as 1925, taking her two children with her. Is that a customary type date that you're allowed to um, comment on for us? Or are you commenting on a, a time when that was maybe discontinued in many places? No, I don't think it would be discontinued at all. Um, I, I think it, the impression I got, I think we work out the ages of the people who were telling me that they travelled as children. I mean, it would probably still be going on right up to the Second World War, I would think. Mm -hmm. mm. So that, no, 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 that, 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 that uh, example you've given uh, would, would come well into that category. So. Thank you. Mm. Okay, is that us? Are we ready to move on? Um, there, is, there is one more question just right, about okay. um, just the interaction between English and Scottish herring girls. Margaret, I don't know if you could say anything about that. We've had a really interesting comment from Jan B. Brown saying that um, the Scarborough landladies would cry when they're getting girls left. So mm. some of them must have built up relationships. Mm. It was quite a long you know, period of time when they would have come back year after year, I suppose. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I think you're right about building up the, uh, the, the relationships. Um, and I, I know that when Alan Marr talked about his mother, now he was only six when his, his mother first went away. But in his 70s, when he spoke to me, he could still tell me the name and address of the woman that his mother lodged with every year because Alan used to write to her. And, uh, you know, and, and there was that connection. Um, I don't know. I'm not too sure about the the relationship between the the, the English and the Scottish women. Um, I don't know if the English women were engaged in the same type of contracts. You know, I know in some places um, women arriving with jobs and contracts of good money might have caused some tension. Um, I really don't know about that. Well, we've got, we've got, we'll probably wrap up this mm. talk now. Um, there's a few more really interesting comments in the chat, but you can all, you can all see them and we'll maybe have time to discuss them a bit in more detail um, mm. at, at four o'clock when the, the three formal talks are over. Um, we'll just maybe have a quick comfort break if you want to fill up your coffee cups, everyone that's up at midnight or one in the morning coming up for now. Um, and um, just meet back at two o'clock for our talk with Meg. So you just just got five minutes just to regroup and um, okay. thank see you in a second or two. Okay, thank you.